Chapter Seven of the Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrion. Chapter Seven. Several uneventful days followed my life at nidic was becoming dull and monotonous every morning there was the doleful bugle call of the huntsman whose occupation was gone then came a visit to the count after that breakfast with sperver's interminable speculations upon the black plague the incessant gossiping and chattering of marie lagoutte maitre tobias and all that pack of idle servants who had nothing to do but eat and drink, smoke and go to sleep. The only man who had any kind of individual existence was Knapwurst, who sat buried up to the tip of his red nose in old chronicles all the day long, careless of the cold, so long as there was anything left to find out in his curious researches. My weariness of all this may easily be imagined. Ten times had Sperver taken me over the stables and the kennels, the dogs were beginning to know me i knew by heart all the coarse pleasantries of the major domo over his bottles and marie lagoutte's invariable replies sibalt's melancholy was infecting me i would gladly have blown a little on his horn to tell the mountains of my ennui and my eyes were incessantly directed towards freeborg still the disorder of yeri hans lord of nidic was taking its usual course and this gave my only occupation any serious interest. All the particulars which Sperver had made me acquainted with appeared clearly before me. Sometimes the Count, waking up with a start, would half rise and, supported on his elbow, with neck outstretched and haggard eyes, would mutter, She is coming, she is coming. Then Gideon would shake his head and ascend the signal tower but neither right nor left could the black plague be discovered. After long reflection upon this strange malady, I had come to the conclusion that the sufferer was insane. The strange influence that the old hag exercised over him, his alternate phases of madness and lucidity, all confirmed me in this view. Medical men who have given especial attention to the subject of mental aberrations are well aware that periodical madness is of not unfrequent occurrence in some cases the illness appears several times in the year in others at only particular seasons of the year i know at freeborg an old lady who for thirty years past has regularly presented herself at the door of the asylum at her own request they place her in confinement then the unhappy woman every night passes through the terrible scenes of the french revolution of which she was a witness in her youth she trembles in the hands of the executioner she fancies herself drenched with the blood of the victims she weeps and cries aloud incessantly in the course of a few weeks the mind returns to its wonted seat and she is restored to liberty with the full expectation that she will return again in a year the count of nidic is suffering from a similar attack i said unknown chains unite his fate with that of the black plague who can tell thought i that woman once was young perhaps beautiful and my imagination once launched carried me into the interesting regions of romance but i was careful to tell no one what i thought if i had opened out those conjectures to sperver he would never have forgiven me for imagining that there could have been any intimacy between his master and the black plague and as for mademoiselle odile i dared not suggest insanity to her the poor young lady was evidently most unhappy her refusal to marry had so embittered the count against her that he could scarcely endure to have her in his presence he bitterly reproached her with her ingratitude and disobedience and expatiated upon the cruelty of ungrateful children sometimes even violent curses followed his daughter's visits things at last were so bad that i thought myself obliged to interfere 
i therefore waited one evening on the countess in the antechamber and entreated her to relinquish her personal attendance upon her father but here arose contrary to all expectations quite an unforeseen obstacle in spite of all my entreaties she steadily insisted on watching by her father and nursing him as she had done hitherto it is my duty she repeated and no arguments will shake my purpose she said firmly madam i replied as a last effort the medical profession too has its duties and an honourable man must fulfil them even to harshness and cruelty your presence is killing your father i shall remember all my life the sudden change in the expression of the face of odile my solemn words of warning seemed to cause the blood to flow back to the heart her face became white as marble and her large blue eyes fixed steadily upon mine seemed to read into the most secret recesses of my soul is that possible sir she stammered upon your honour do you declare this tell me truly yes madam upon my honour there was a long and painful silence only broken at last by these words in a low voice let god's will be done and with downcast eyes she withdrew the day after this scene about eight in the morning i was pacing up and down in hugh lupus's tower thinking of the count's illness of which i could not foretell the issue and i was thinking too of my patients at fribourg whom i might lose by too prolonged an absence when three discreet taps upon my door turned my thoughts into another channel come in the door opened and marie lagoutte stood within dropping me a low curtsy this old dame's visit put me out and i was going to beg her to postpone her visit when something mysterious in her countenance caught my attention she had thrown over her shoulders a red and green shawl she was biting her lips with her head down and as soon as she had closed the door she opened it again and peeped out to make sure that no one had followed her what does she want with me i thought what is the meaning of all these precautions and i was quite puzzled monsieur le docteur said the worthy lady advancing towards me i beg your pardon for disturbing you so early in the morning but i have a very serious thing to tell you pray tell me all about it then it is the count indeed yes sir you know that i sat up with him last night i know pray sit down she sat before me in a great armchair and i could not help noticing the energetic character of her head which on the evening of my arrival at the castle had only seemed to me grotesque doctor she resumed after a short pause and with her dark eyes upon me you know i am not timid or easily frightened i have seen so many dreadful things in the course of my life that i am astonished at nothing now when you have seen marengo austerlitz and moscow there is nothing left that can put you out i am sure of that ma'am i don't want to boast that is not my reason for telling you this but it is to show you that i am not an escaped lunatic and that you may believe me when i tell you what i say i have seen this was becoming interesting well the good woman resumed last night between nine and ten just as i was going to bed offenloch came in and said to me marie you will have to sit up with the count tonight at first i felt surprised what is not mademoiselle going to sit up no mademoiselle is poorly and you will have to take her place poor girl she is ill i knew that would be the end of it i told her so a hundred times but it is always so young people won't believe those who are older and then it is her father so i took my knitting said good night to tobias and went into monseigneur's room sperver was there waiting for me and went to bed so there i was all alone here the good woman stopped a moment indulged in a pinch of snuff and tried to arrange her thoughts 
i listened with eager attention for what was coming about half past ten she went on i was sitting near the bed and from time to time drew the curtain to see what the count was doing he made no movement he was sleeping as quietly as a child it was all right until eleven o'clock then i began to feel tired an old woman sir cannot help herself she must drop off to sleep in spite of everything i did not think anything was going to happen and i said to myself he is sure to sleep till daylight about twelve the wind went down the big windows had been rattling but now they were quiet i got up to see if anything was stirring outside it was all as black as ink so i came back to my armchair i took another look at the patient i saw that he had not stirred an inch and i took up my knitting but in a few minutes more i began nodding nodding and i dropped right off to sleep i could not help it the armchair was so soft and the room was so warm who could have helped it i had been asleep an hour i suppose when a sharp current of wind woke me up i opened my eyes and what do you think i saw the tall middle window was wide open the curtains were drawn and there in the opening stood the count in his white nightdress right on the window sill the count yes nay it is impossible he cannot move so i thought too but that is just how i saw him he was standing with a torch in his hand the night was so dark and the air so still that the flame stood up quite straight i gazed upon marie anne with astonishment first of all she said after a moment's silence to see that long thin man standing there with his bare legs i can assure you it had such an effect upon me i wanted to scream but then i thought perhaps he is walking in his sleep if i shout he will wake up he will jump down and then so i did not say a word but i stared and stared till i saw him lift up his torch in the air over his head then he lowered it then up again and down again and he did this three times just like a man making signals then he threw it down upon the ramparts shut the window drew the curtains passed before me without speaking and got into bed muttering some words i could not make out are you sure you saw all that ma'am quite sure well it is strange i know it is but it is true ah it did astonish me at first and then when i saw him get into bed again and cross his hands over his breast just as if nothing had happened i said to myself marie anne you have had a bad dream it cannot be true and so i went to the window and there i saw the torch still burning it had fallen into a bush near the third gate and there it was shining just like a spark of fire there was no denying it marie lagoutte looked at me a few moments without speaking you may be sure doctor that after that i had no more sleep i sat watching and ready for anything every moment i fancied i could hear something behind the armchair i was not afraid it was not that but i was uneasy and restless when morning came very early i ran and woke offenlock and sent him to the count passing down the corridor i noticed that there was no torch in the first ring and i came down and found it near the narrow path to the schwarzwald there it is and the good woman took from under her apron the end of a torch which she threw upon the table i was confounded how had that man whom i had seen the night before feeble and exhausted been able to rise walk lift up and close down that heavy window what was the meaning of that signal by night i seemed to myself to witness this strange mysterious scene and my thoughts went off at once to the black plague when i aroused myself from this contemplation of my own thoughts i saw marie lagoutte rising and preparing to go you have done quite right i said as i took her to the door to tell me of these things and i am much obliged to you 
have you told anyone else of this adventure no one sir such things are only to be told to the priest and the doctor come i see you are a very wise sensible woman these words were exchanged at the door of my tower at this moment sperver appeared at the end of the gallery followed by his friend sebalt fritz he shouted i have got news to tell you oh come thought i more news this is a strange condition of things marie lagoutte had disappeared and the huntsman and his friend entered the tower end of chapter seven recording by james k white chula vista chapter eight of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white chula vista the man wolf by emile erkman and alexandre chatrion chapter eight on the countenance of sperver was an expression of suppressed wrath on that of his companion bitter irony this worthy sportsman whose woeful physiognomy had struck me on my first arrival at nideck was as thin and dry as a lath his hunting jacket was girded tightly about him by his belt from which hung a hunting knife with a horn handle long leathern gaiters came above his knees the horn went over his shoulder from right to left the wide expanded opening under his arm on his head a wide-brimmed hat with a heron's plume in the buckle his profile coming to a point in a reddish tuft looked not unlike a goat's yes cried sperver i have got strange things to tell you he threw himself in a chair seizing his head between his clenched hands while dismal sebalt calmly drew his horn over his head and laid it on the table now sebalt cried gideon speak out the witch is hanging about the castle this piece of intelligence would have failed to interest me before seeing marie lagoutte but now it struck more forcibly there certainly was some mysterious connection between the lord of nideck and that old woman i knew nothing of the nature of this connection and i felt that at whatever cost i must know it just wait a moment friends said i to sperver and his comrade i want to know first of all where does this black pest come from sperver stared at me with astonishment come from who can tell that very well you can't but when does she come within sight of nideck as i told you ten days before christmas at the same time every year and how long does she stay a fortnight or three weeks is she ever seen before not even on her way nor after no then we shall have to catch her seize upon her i cried this is contrary to nature we must find out where she comes from what she wants here what she is lay hold of her exclaimed sperver seize her do you mean it and he shook his head fritz your advice is good enough in its way but it is easier said than done i could very easily send a bullet after her almost at any time but the count won't consent to that measure and as for catching in any other way than by powder and shot why you had better go first and catch a squirrel by the tail listen to sebalt's story and you shall judge for yourself the master of the hounds sitting on the table with his long legs crossed fixed his eyes mournfully upon me and began his tale this morning as i was coming down from the altenburg i followed the hollow road to nideck the snow filled it up entirely i was going on my way thinking of nothing particular when i noticed a foot track it was deep down and went across the road the person had come down the bank and gone up on the other side it was not a soft hare's foot which hardly leaves an impression it was not forked like a wild boar's track it was not like a cloven hoof such as the wolf's it was a deep hole i stopped and stooped down and cleared away the loose snow that fell round 
and came upon the very track of the black pest are you sure it was that of course i am i know the old woman by her foot better than by her figure for i always go sir with my eyes on the ground i know everybody by their tracks and as for this one a child might know it what then distinguishes this foot so particularly it is so small that you could cover it with your hand it is finely shaped the heel is rather long the outline clean the great toe lies close to the other toes and they are all as fine as if they were in a lady's slipper it is a lovely foot twenty years ago i should have fallen in love with a foot like that whenever i come across it it has such an effect upon me no one could believe that such a foot could belong to the black plague and the poor fellow joining his hands together contemplated the stone floor with doleful eyes well sabalt what next asked sperver impatiently ah uh, yes to be sure well i recognized that track and started off in pursuit i was hoping to catch the creature in her lair but i will tell you the way she took me i climbed up the bank by the roadside only two gunshots from nidick i go along the hill keeping the track on my right it led along the side of the wood in the rathal all at once it jumps over the ditch into the wood i stuck to it but happening to look a little to my left i saw another track which had been following the black plague i stopped short was it sperver's or caspar trump's or whose i came to it and you may fancy how astounded i was when i saw that it was nobody from our place i know every foot in the schwarzwald from freeborg to nidick that foot was like none of ours it must have come from a distance the boot for it was a kind of well-made soft gentleman's boot with spurs which leave a little print behind them the boot was not round at the toes but square the sole was thin and bent with every step and it had no nails in it the walk was rapid and the short steps were like those of a young man of twenty to five and twenty i noticed the stitches in the side leather at once and i think i never saw finer who can this be sperver exclaimed sabalt raised his shoulders and extended his hands but said nothing who can have any object in following the old woman i asked sperver no one on earth can tell was the reply and so we sat a few minutes meditating over what we had heard at last he went on again with his narrative i kept following the track it went up the next ridge through the pine forest when it doubled round the roche i said to myself ah you accursed plague if there was much game of your sort there would not be much sport it would be preferable to work like a nigger so we all three arrive the two tracks and i at the top of the schneeberg there the wind had been blowing hard the snow was knee-deep but no matter i must get on i got to the edge of the torrent of the steinbach and there i lost the track i halted and i saw that after trying up and down in several directions the gentleman's boots had gone down the tiefenbach that was a bad sign i looked along the other side of the torrent but there was no appearance of a track there none at all the old hag had paddled up and down the stream to throw anyone off the scent who should try to follow her where was i to go to right or left or straight on not knowing i came back to nidick you haven't told us about her breakfast said sperver no i was forgetting at the foot of roche i saw there had been a fire there was a black place i laid my hand upon it thinking it might be warm which would have proved that the black plague had not gone far but it was as cold as ice close by i saw a wire trap in the bushes it seems the creature knows how to snare game a hare had been caught in it the print of its body was still plain lying flat in the snow the witch had lighted the fire to cook it she had had a good breakfast i'll be bound at this sperver cried indignantly just fancy that old witch living on meat while so many honest folks in our villages have nothing better than potatoes to eat that's what upsets me fritz ah if i had but 
but his thoughts remained untold he turned deadly pale and all three of us in a moment stood rigid and motionless staring with horror at each other's ghastly countenances a yell the howling cry of the wolf in the long cold days of winter the cry which none can imagine who has not heard the most fearful and harrowing of all bestial sounds that fearful cry was echoing through the castle not far from us it rose up the spiral staircase it filled the mass of building as if the hungry savage beast was at our door travellers speak of the deep roar of the lion troubling the silence of the night amidst the rocky deserts of africa but while the tropical regions sultry and baked resound with the vibrations of the mighty voice of the savage monarch of the desert making the air tremble with the distant thunder of his awful cry the vast snowy deserts of the north too have their characteristic cry a strange lamentable yell that seems to suit the character of the dreary winter scene that voice of the northern desert is the howl of the wolf the instant after this awful sound had broken upon the silence followed another formidable body of discordant sounds the baying and yelling of sixty hounds answering from the ramparts of nidic the whole pack gave voice at the same moment the deep bay of the bloodhound the sharp cry of the pointer the plaintive yelpings of the spaniels and the melancholy howl of the mastiffs all mingling in confusion with the rattling of dog chains the shaking of the kennels under the struggles of the hounds to get loose and dominating over all the long dismal prolonged note of the wolf's monotonous howl his was the leading part in this horrible canine concert sperver sprang from his seat and ran out upon the platform to see if a wolf had dropped into the moat but no the howling came from neither then turning to us he cried fritz sibalt come come quickly we flew down the steps four at a time and rushed into the fencing school here we heard the cry of the wolf alone prolonged beneath the echoing arches the distant barking and yelling of the pack became almost inaudible in the distance the dogs were hoarse with rage and excitement their chains were getting entangled together perhaps they were strangling each other sperver drew the keen blade of his hunting knife sibalt did the same they preceded me down the gallery then the fearful sounds became our guide to the sick man's room sperver spoke no more he hurried forward sibalt stretched his long legs i felt a shuddering horror creep through my whole frame a horrible presentiment of something shocking and abominable came over us as we approached the apartments of the count we met the whole household afoot the gamekeepers the huntsmen the kennel keepers the scullions were all mingled and jostling each other asking what is the matter where are those cries coming from without stopping we ran into the passage which led to the count's bedroom where we met poor marie Legoutte, who alone had had the courage to penetrate thither before us she was holding in her arms the young countess who had fainted her head falling back her hair flowing down behind her she was carrying her away as fast as she could we passed her so rapidly that we scarcely had time to witness this sad sight but it has since returned to my memory and the pale face of odile lying on the ample shoulders of the good servant still makes a vivid impression upon my memory resembling the poor lamb presenting its throat to the knife without a complaint dying with fear before the stroke falls at last we had reached the count's chamber the howling came from behind his door we stole fearful glances at one another without attempting to account for the hideous noise or explaining the presence of such a wild guest in the house indeed we had no time our ideas were in dire and utter confusion sperver hastily pushed the door open and knife in hand was darting into the room but he stood arrested on the threshold motionless as a stone never have i seen such a picture of horror as he displayed standing rooted there with his eyes starting from his head and his mouth wide open and gasping for breath i gazed over his shoulder and the sight that met my eyes made the blood run chill as snow in my veins the lord of nidic 
crouching on all fours upon his bed with his arms bending forward his head carried low his eyes glaring with fierce fires was uttering loud protracted howlings he was the wolf that low receding forehead that sharp pointed face that foxy looking beard bristling off both cheeks the long meagre figure the sinewy limbs the face the cry the attitude declared the presence of the wild beast half hidden half revealed under a human mask at times he would stop for a second and listen attentively with head awry and then the crimson hangings would tremble with the quivering of his limbs like foliage shaken by the wind then the melancholy wail would open afresh sperver sabalt and i stood nailed to the floor we held our breath petrified with fear suddenly the count stopped as a wild beast scents the wind he lifted his head and listened again there there far away down among the thick fir forests whitened with dense patches of snow a cry was heard in reply weak at first then the sound rose and swelled in a long protracted howl drowning the feebler efforts of the hounds it was the she-wolf answering the wolf sperver turning round awe-stricken his countenance pale as ashes pointed to the mountain and murmured low listen there's the witch and the count still crouching motionless but with his head now raised in the attitude of attention his neck outstretched his eyes burning seemed to understand the meaning of that distant voice lost amidst the passes and peaks of the schwarzwald and a kind of fearful joy gleamed in his savage features at this moment sperver unable or unwilling to restrain himself any longer cried in a voice broken with emotion count of nideck what are you doing the count fell back thunderstruck we rushed into the room to his help it was time the third attack had commenced and it was terrible to witness end of chapter eight recording by james k white chula vista chapter nine of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrion. Chapter 9. The Lord of Nideck was in a dying state. What can science do in presence of the great mortal strife between death and life? At the supreme hour, when the invisible wrestlers are writhed together, body to body, and limb to limb, panting, each in turn overthrowing and overthrown, what avails the healing art? One can but watch, and tremble, and listen. At times the struggle seems suspended, a truce has sounded, life has retired into her hold, she is resting. She is collecting the courage of despair. But the relentless enemy beats at the gates. He bursts in. Then life springs to the rescue and again grapples with her adversary. The strife is renewed with fresh fuel added to the fire of mortal energy as the fatal issue draws closer and nearer. And the exhausted patient, himself the field of battle, weltering in the cold sweat of death the eye set and the arm powerless can do nothing for himself his breathing sometimes short broken and distressing sometimes long deep labored and heavy indicates the varying phases of this dreadful struggle the bystanders watch each other's faces and they think the day will come when we in our turns shall be the field of the same strife and victorious death will bear us away into the grave his den as the spider carries away the fly but the true life the only life 
the soul spreading her immortal wings will speed her flight to another world with the exulting cry i have fought the good fight i have finished my course i have kept the faith and death disappointed of its prey will look up at the emancipated being unable to follow and holding in its clutches only a cold and decaying corpse soon to be a handful of dust o oh, death where is thy sting o oh, grave where is thy victory o oh, best and only consolation the hope and belief in the final triumph of justice the certainty of immortal life through jesus christ the saviour cruel indeed is he who would rob man of the chief brightness and glory of life towards midnight the count of nidic seemed almost gone the agony of death was at hand the broken weakened pulse indicated the sinking of the vital powers then it might return to a more active state but there seemed no hope my only duty left was to stay and see this unhappy man die i was exhausted with fatigue and anxiety whatever art could do i had tried i told sperver to sit up and close his master's eyes in death the poor faithful fellow was in the utmost distress he reproached himself with his involuntary cry count of nidic what are you doing and tore his hair in bitter repentance i went away alone to hugh lupus's tower having had scarcely any time to take food but i did not feel the want of it there was a bright fire on the hearth i threw myself dressed upon the bed and sleep soon came to relieve my weight of apprehension that heavy sleep broken by the consciousness that you may any minute be awoke by tears and lamentations i was sleeping thus with my face turned towards the fire and as it often happens the flame fitfully rising and falling threw a fluttering flickering light like those of ruddy flapping wings against the walls and wearied still more my dropping eyelids lost in a dreamy slumber i was half opening my eyes to see the cause of these alternate lights and shadows but the strangest sight surprised me close by the hearth hardly revealed by the feeble light of a few dying embers i recognized with dismay the dark profile of the black plague she sat upon a low stool and was evidently warming herself at first i thought myself deceived by my senses which would have been natural enough after the exciting scenes of the last few days i raised myself upon my elbow gazing with my eyes starting with fear and horror it was she indeed i lay horrified for there she sat calm and immovable with her hands clasped over her skinny knees just as i had seen her in the snow with her long scraggy neck outstretched her hooked nose her compressed lips how had the black pest got here how had she found her way into this high tower crowning the dangerous precipices everything that sperver had told me of this mysterious being seemed to be coming true and now the unaccountable behavior of liverle growling so fiercely against the wall seemed clear as the daylight i huddled myself close up into the alcove hardly daring to breathe and staring upon this motionless profile just as a mouse out of its hole fixes its paralyzed stare upon the cat that is watching for it the old woman stirred no more than the rock-hewn pillars on each side of the hearthstone and her lips were mumbling inarticulate sounds my heart was palpitating my fears increased momentarily during the long silence made more startling by the motionless supernatural figure that sat there before me this had lasted a quarter of an hour when the fire catching a splinter of fir wood a flash of light broke out the shaving twisted and flamed and a few rays of light flared to the end of the room that luminous jet was sufficient to show me that the creature was clothed in an old dress of rich purple silk as stiff as cardboard with a violet pattern there was a massive bracelet upon her left wrist 
and a gold arrow stuck through her thick grey hair twisted over the back of her head it was like an apparition out of the ages past still the plague could have had no hostile intentions towards me or she might easily have taken advantage of my sleep to have put them in execution that thought was beginning to give me some confidence when suddenly she rose from her seat and with slow steps approached my bed holding in her hand a torch which she had just lighted i then observed that her eyes were fixed and haggard i made an effort to rise and cry aloud but not a muscle of my body would obey my wishes not a breath came to my lips and the old woman bending over me between the curtains fixed her stony stare upon me with a strange unearthly smile i wanted to call for help i wanted to drive her from me but her petrifying stare seemed to fascinate and paralyze me just as that of the serpent fixes the little bird motionless before it during this speechless contemplation minutes seemed like hours what was she about to do i was ready for any event suddenly she turned her head went round upon her heel listened strode across the room and opened the door at last i recovered a little courage an effort of the will brought me to my feet as if i were acted on by a spring i darted after her footsteps she with one hand was holding her torch on high and with the other kept the door open i was about to seize her by the hair when at the end of the long gallery under the gothic archway of the castle leading to the ramparts i saw a tall figure it was the count of nidic the count of nidic whom i had thought a dying man clad in a huge wolf skin thrown with its upper jaw projecting grimly over his eyes like a visor the formidable claws hanging over each shoulder and the tail dragging behind him along the flags he wore stout heavy shoes a silver clasp gathered the wolfskin round his neck and his whole aspect but for the ice-cold deathly expression of his face proclaimed the man born for command the master in the presence of such an imposing personage my ideas became vague and confused flight was no longer possible yet i had the presence of mind to throw myself into the embrasure of the window the count entered my room with his eyes fixed on the old woman and his features unrelaxed they spoke to one another in hoarse whispers so low that i could not distinguish a word but there was no mistaking their gestures the woman was pointing to the bed they approached the fireplace on tiptoe there in the dark shadow of the recess at its side the black plague with a horrible smile unrolled a large bag as soon as the count saw the bag he made a bound towards the bed and kneeled upon it with one knee there was a shaking of the curtains his body disappeared beneath their folds and i could only see one leg still resting on the floor and the wolf's tail undulating irregularly from side to side they seemed to be acting a murder in ghastly pantomime no real scene however frightful could have agitated me more than this mute representation of some horrible deed then the old woman ran to his assistance carrying the bag with her again the curtains shook and the shadows crossed the walls but the most horrible of all was that i fancied i saw a pool of blood creeping across the floor and slowly reaching the hearth but it was only the snow that had clung to the count's boots and was melting in the heat i was still gazing upon this dark stream feeling my dry tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth when there was a great movement the old woman and the count were stuffing the sheets of the bed into the sack they were thrusting and stamping them in with just the same haste as a dog scratching at a hole then the lord of nidic flung this unshapely bundle over his shoulder and made for the door a sheet was dragging behind him and the old woman followed him torch in hand they went across the court my knees were almost giving way under me they knocked together for fear i prayed for strength 
in a couple of minutes i was on their footsteps dragged forward by a sudden irresistible impulse i crossed the court at a run and was just going to enter the door of the tower when i perceived a deep but narrow pit at my feet down which went a winding staircase and there far below i could see the torch describing a spiral course around the stone rail like a little star at last it was lost in the distance now i also descended the first steps of this newly discovered staircase directing my course after this distant light suddenly it vanished the old woman and the count had reached the bottom of the precipice supported by the stone rail i continued my descent safe to be able to mount again if i found my further progress stopped soon i came to the last step i looked around me and discovered on my left hand a narrow streak of moonlight shining under a low door through the nestles and brambles i kicked a way through these obstacles clearing the snow away with my feet and then i found that i was at the very foot of the keep hugh's dungeon tower who would have supposed that such a hole would have led up into the castle who had shown it to the old woman i did not stay to satisfy myself on these points the vast plain lay spread before me bathed in a light almost equal to that of day on the right lay extended wide the dark line of the black forest with its craggy rocks its gullies its passes stretching away as far as the sight could reach the night air was keen and sharp but perfectly calm and i felt myself awakened to the highest degree almost as if my senses were volatilized by the still and ice-cold air my first examination of the horizon was for the figures of the count and his strange companion i soon distinguished their tall dark forms standing out sharply against the star-spangled purple heavens i nearly overtook them at the bottom of the ravine the count was moving with deliberate steps the imaginary winding sheet dragging slowly after him there was an automatic precision in the movements of both i kept six or eight yards behind them down the hollow road to the altenburg now in the shade now in the full light for the moon was shining with astonishing brilliancy a few clouds floated idly across the zenith seeming to want to clasp her in their long arms but she ever eluded their grasp and her rays keen as a blade of steel cut me to the marrow of my bones i could have wished to turn back but some invisible power impelled me onwards to follow this funeral procession in pantomime even to this day i fancy still i can see the rough mountain path through the black forest i can hear the crisp snow crackling underfoot and the dead leaves rustling in the light north wind i can see myself following those two silent beings but i cannot understand what mysterious power drew me in their footsteps at last we reached the forest and advance amongst the tall bare branched beeches the dark shadows of their higher boughs intersect the lower branches and fall broken upon the snow encumbered road sometimes i fancy i can hear steps behind me i turn sharply round but can see no one we had just reached the long rocky ridge that forms the crest of the altenburg behind it flows the torrent of the schneeberg but in winter no current is visible scarcely does a mere thread of its blue waters trickle under the thick crust of ice here the deep solitude is broken by no murmuring brooks no warblings of birds no thunder of the waterfall in the vast unbroken solitudes the awful silence is terrible the count of nideck and the old woman found a gap in the face of the rock up which they mounted straight with marvellous celerity whilst i had to pull myself up by the help of the bushes hardly had they reached the ridge of the crags which came almost to a point when i was within three yards of them and i beheld beyond a dreadful precipice of which i could not see the bottom at the left hung in the air like a vast sheet the fall of the schneeberg a mass of ice that resemblance to an immense wave 
taking the precipice at one bound bearing trees on its breast fringed with the bushes and winding out the long ivy sprays which exhibit in their delicate tracery the form of the rigid glassy billow that mere semblance of movement amidst the stillness and immovableness of death and the presence of those two speechless creatures pursuing their ghastly work with automatic precision added to the terror with which i already trembled nature herself seemed to shrink with horror the count had laid down his burden the old woman and he took it up together swung it for a moment over the edge of the precipice then the long shroud floated over the abyss and the imaginary murderers in silence bent forward to see it fall that long white sheet floating in the air is still present before my eyes it descends it falls like a wild swan shot in the clouds spreading its wide wings the long neck thrown back whirling down to earth to die the white burden disappeared in the dark depths of the precipice at last the cloud which i had long seen threatening to cover the moon's bright disk veiled her in its steel-blue folds and her rays ceased to shine the old woman holding the count by the hand and dragging him forward with hurried steps came for a moment into view the cloud had overshadowed the moon and i could not move out of their way without danger of falling over the precipice after a few minutes during which i lay as close as i could there was a rift in the cloud i looked out again i stood alone on the point of the peak with the snow up to my knees full of horror and apprehension i descended from my perilous position and ran to the castle in as much consternation as if i had been guilty of some great crime as for the lord of nideck and his companion i lost sight of them End of chapter 9. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Chapter 10 of The Man Wolf. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emil Erkman and alexandre chatrian chapter ten i wandered around the castle of nideck unable to find the exit from which i had commenced my melancholy journey so much anxiety and uneasiness were beginning to tell upon my mind i staggered on wondering if i was not mad unable to believe in what i had seen and yet alarmed at the clearness of my own perceptions my mind in confusion passed in review that strange man waving his torch overhead in the darkness howling like a wolf coldly inaccurately going through all the details of an imaginary murder without the omission of one ghastly detail or circumstance then escaping and committing to the furious torrent the secret of his crime these things all harassed my mind hurried confusedly past my eyes and made me feel as if i were laboring under a nightmare lost in the snow i ran to and fro panting and alarmed and unable to judge which way to direct my steps as day drew near the cold became sharper i shivered i execrated sperver for having brought me from fribourg to bear a part in this hideous adventure at last exhausted my beard a mass of ice my ears nearly frostbitten I discovered the gate and rang the bell with all my might it was then about four in the morning knapwurst made me wait a terribly long time his little lodge cut in the rock remained silent i thought the little humpbacked wretch would never have done dressing for of course i supposed he would be in bed and asleep i rang again this time his grotesque figure appeared abruptly and he cried to me from the door in a fury who are you i dr fritz oh that alters the case and he went back into his lodge for a lantern crossed the outer court where the snow came up to his middle and staring at me through the grating he exclaimed i beg your pardon dr fritz 
I thought you would be asleep up there in Hugh Lupus's tower. Were you ringing? Now that explains why Sperver came to me about midnight to ask if anybody had gone out. I said no, which was quite true, for I never saw you going out. But pray, Monsieur Knapwurst, do for pity's sake let me in, and I will tell you all about that by and by. Come, come, sir, a little patience. And the hunchback, with the slowest deliberation, undid the padlock and slipped the bars, whilst my teeth were chattering, and I stood shivering from head to foot. You are very cold, doctor, said the diminutive man, and you cannot get into the castle. Sperver has fastened the inside door. I don't know why. He does not usually do so. The outer gate is enough. Come in here and get warm. You won't find my little hole very inviting, though. It is nothing but a sty, but when a man is as cold as you are, he is not apt to be particular. Without replying to his chatter, I followed him in as quickly as I could. We went into the hut, and in spite of my complete state of numbness, I could not help admiring the state of picturesque disorder in which I found the place. The slate roof leaning against the rock and resting by its other side on a wall not more than six feet high showed the smoky, blackened rafters from end to end. The whole edifice consisted of but one apartment, furnished with a very uninviting bed, which the dwarf did not often take the trouble to make, and two small windows with hexagonal panes, weather-stained with the rainbow tints of mother-of-pearl. A large square table filled up the middle, and it would be difficult to account for that massive oak slab being got in, unless by supposing it to have been there before the hut was built. On shelves against the wall were rolls of parchment, and old books great and small. Wide open on the table lay a fine black letter volume, with illuminations, bound in vellum, clasped and cornered with silver, apparently a collection of old chronicles. Besides there was nothing but two leathern armchairs, bearing on them the unmistakable impression of the misshapen figure of this learned gentleman. I need not stay to do more than mention the pens, the jar of tobacco, five or six pipes lying here and there, and in a corner a small cast-iron stove with its low open door wide open, and throwing out now and then a volley of bright sparks. And to complete the picture, the cat arching her back, and spitting threateningly at me with her armed paw uplifted. All this scene was tinted with that deep, rich amber light in which the old Flemish painters delighted, and of which they alone possessed the secret, and never left it to the generations after them. "'So you went out last night, doctor?' inquired my host, after we had both installed ourselves, and while I had my hands in a warm place upon the stove. "'Yes, pretty early,' I answered. "'I had to look after a patient.' This brief explanation seemed to satisfy the little hunchback, and he lighted his blackened boxwood pipe, which was hanging over his chin. You don't smoke, doctor? I beg your pardon, I do. Well, fill any one of these pipes. I was here, he said, spreading his yellow hand over the open volume. I was reading the Chronicles of Herzog when you came. Ah, that accounts for the time I had to wait. Of course you stayed to finish the chapter. I said, smiling. He owned it, grinning, and we both laughed together. But if I had known it was you, he said, I should have finished the chapter another time. There was a short silence during which I was observing the very peculiar physiognomy of this misshapen being, those long, deep wrinkles that moated in his wide mouth, his small eyes with the crow's feet at the outer corners, that contorted nose, bulbous at its end, and especially that huge double-storied forehead of his. The whole figure reminded me not a little of the received pictures of Socrates, and while warming myself and listening to the crackling of the fire, I went off into contemplations on the very diversified fortunes of mankind. Here is this dwarf, I thought, an ill-shaped, stunted caricature, banished into a corner of Nidic, and living just like the cricket that chirps beneath the hearthstone. Here is this little Knapwurst, who, in the midst of excitement, grand hunts, gallant trains of horsemen coming and going, the barking of the hounds, the trampling of the horses, and the shouts of the hunters, 
is living quietly all alone, buried in his books and thinking of nothing but the times long gone by, whilst joy or sorrow, songs or tears, fill the world around him, while spring and summer, autumn and winter, come and look in through his dim windows, by turns brightening, warming, and benumbing the face of nature outside. Whilst men in the outer world are subject to the gentle influences of love, or the sterner impulses of ambition or avarice, hoping, coveting, longing, and desiring, he neither hopes, nor desires, nor covets anything. As long as he is smoking his pipe, with his eyes feasting on a musty parchment, he lives in the enjoyment of dreams, and he goes into raptures over things long, long ago gone by, or which have never existed at all. It is all one to him. Herzog says so-and-so. Somebody else tells the tale a different way. And he is perfectly happy. His leathery face gets more and more deeply wrinkled. His broken angular back bends into sharper angles and corners. His pointed elbows dig beds for themselves in the oak table. His skinny fingers bury themselves in his cheeks. His piggish gray eyes get redder over manuscripts Latin, Greek, or medieval. He falls into raptures. He smacks his lips. He licks his chops like a cat over a dainty dish. And then he throws himself upon that dirty litter with his knees up to his chin, and he thinks he has had a delightful day. O oh, providence of God! Is a man's duty best done? Are his responsibilities best discharged at the top or at the bottom of the scale of human life? But the snow was melting away from my legs. The balmy warmth of the stove was shedding a pleasant influence over my feelings, and I felt myself reviving in this mixed atmosphere of tobacco smoke and burning pine wood. Knapwurst gravely laid his pipe on the table and reverently spreading his hand upon the folio, said in a voice that seemed to issue from the bottom of his consciousness, or, if you like it better, from the bottom of a twenty-gallon cask. Dr. Fritz, here is the law and the prophets. How so? What do you mean? Parchment. Old parchment. That is what I love. These old yellow rusty worm-eaten leaves are all that is left to us of the past, from the days of Charlemagne until this day. The oldest families disappear, the old parchments remain. Where would be the glory of the Hohenstaufens, the Leiningens, the Nidics, and of so many other families of renown? Where would be the fame of their titles, their deeds of arms, their magnificent armor, their expeditions to the Holy Land, their alliances, their claims to remote antiquity, their conquests once complete, now long ago annulled. Where would be all those grand claims to historic fame without these parchments? Nowhere at all. Those high and mighty barons, those great dukes and princes, would be as if they had never been, they and everything that related to them far and near. Their strong castles, their palaces, their fortresses fall and moulder away into masses of ruin, vague remembrancers. Of all that greatness, one monument alone remains, the chronicles, the songs of bards and minnesingers. Parchment alone remains. He sat silent for a moment, and then pursued his reflections. And in those distant times, while knights and squires rode out to war and fought and conquered or fought and fell over the possession of a nook in a forest or a title or a smaller matter still, with what scorn and contempt did they not look down upon the wretched little scribbler, the man of mere letters and jargon, half-clothed in untanned hides, his only weapon an inkhorn at his belt, his pennon the feather of a goose-quill? How they laughed at him, calling him an atom or a flea, good for nothing. He does nothing. He cannot even collect our taxes or look after our estates whilst we bold riders, armed to the teeth, sword in hand and lance on thigh, we fight, and we are the finest fellows in the land. So they said, when they saw the poor devil dragging himself on foot after their horse's heels, shivering in winter and sweating in summer, rusting and decaying in old age. Well, what has happened? That flea, that vermin, 
has kept them in the memory of men longer than their castles stood long after their arms and their armor had rusted in the ground i love those old parchments i respect and revere them like ivy they clothe the ruins and keep the ancient walls from crumbling into dust and perishing in oblivion having thus delivered himself a solemn expression stole over his features and his own eloquence made the tears of moved affection to steal down his furrowed cheeks the poor hunchback evidently loved those who had borne with and protected his unwarlike but clever ancestors and after all he spoke truly and there was profound good sense in his words i was surprised and said monsieur knapwurst do you know latin yes sir he answered but without conceit both latin and greek i taught myself old grammars were quite enough there were some old books of the counts thrown by as rubbish they fell into my hands and i devoured them a little while after the count hearing me drop a latin quotation was quite astonished and said when did you learn latin Napwurst? i taught myself monseigneur he asked me a few questions to which i gave pretty good answers parbleu he cried Napwurst knows more than i do he shall keep my records so he gave me the keys of the archives that was thirty years ago since that time i have read every word sometimes when the count sees me mounted upon my ladder he says what are you doing now Napwurst? i am reading the family archives monseigneur aha is that what you enjoy yes very much come come i am glad to hear it Napwurst but for you who would know anything about the glory of the house of nidic and off he goes laughing i do just as i please so he is a very good master is he oh dr fritz he is the kindest-hearted master he is so frank and so pleasant cried the dwarf with hands clasped he has but one fault and what may that be he has no ambition how do you prove that why he might have been anything he pleased think of a nidic one of the very noblest families in germany he had but to ask to be made a minister or a field marshal well he desired nothing of the sort when he was no longer a young man he retired from political life except that he was in the campaign in france at the head of a regiment he raised at his own expense he has always lived far away from noise and battle plain and simple and almost unknown he seemed to think of nothing but his hunting these details were deeply interesting to me the conversation was of its own accord taking just the turn i wished it to take and i resolved to get my advantage out of it so the count has never had any exciting deeds in hand none dr fritz none whatever and that is the pity a noble excitement is the glory of great families it is a misfortune for a noble race when a member of it is devoid of ambition he allows his family to sink below its level i could give you many examples that which would be very fortunate in a trader's family is the greatest misfortune in a nobleman's i was astonished for all my theories upon the count's past life were falling to the earth still monsieur knapwurst the lord of nidic has had great sorrows had he not such as what the loss of his wife yes you are right there his wife was an angel he married her for love she was a zahn one of the oldest and best nobility of alsace but a family ruined by the revolution the countess odile was the delight of her husband she died of a decline which carried her off after five years illness every plan was tried to save her life they traveled in italy together but she returned worse than she went and died a few weeks after their return the count was almost broken-hearted and for two years he shut himself up and would see no one he neglected his hounds and his horses time at last calmed his grief but there is always a remainder of grief said the hunchback pointing with his finger to his heart you understand very well there is still a bleeding wound 
old wounds you know make themselves felt in change of weather and old sorrows too in spring when the flowers bloom again and in autumn when the dead leaves cover the soil but the count would not marry again all his love is given to his daughter so the marriage was a happy one throughout happy why it was a blessing for everybody i said no more it was plain that the count had not committed and could not have committed a crime i was obliged to yield to evidence but then what was the meaning of that scene at night that strange connection with the black pest that fearful acting that remorse in a dream which impelled the guilty to betray their past atrocities i lost myself in vain conjectures knapwurst relighted his pipe and handed me one which i accepted by that time the icy numbness which had laid hold of me had nearly passed away and i was enjoying that pleasant sense of relief which follows great fatigue when by the chimney corner in a comfortable easy chair veiled in wreaths of tobacco smoke you yield to the luxury of repose and listen idly to the duet between the chirping of a cricket on the hearth and the hissing of the burning log so we sat for a quarter of an hour at last i ventured to remark but sometimes the count gets angry with his daughter knapwurst started and fixing a sinister almost a fierce and hostile eye upon me answered i know i know i watched him narrowly thinking i might learn something now in support of my theory but he simply added ironically the towers of nidic are high and slander flies too low to reach their elevation no doubt but still it is a fact is it not oh yes so it is but after all it is only a craze an effect of his complaint as soon as the crisis is past all his love for mademoiselle comes back i assure you sir that a lover of twenty could not be more devoted more affectionate than he is that young girl is his pride and joy a dozen times have i seen him riding away to get a dress or flowers or what not for her he went off alone and brought back the articles in triumph blowing his horn he would have entrusted so delicate a commission to no one not even to sperver whom he is so fond of mademoiselle never dares express a wish in his hearing lest he should start off and fulfil it at once the lord of nidic is the worthiest master the tenderest father and the kindest and most upright of men those poachers who are forever infesting our woods the old count ludwig would have strung them up without mercy our count winks at them he even turns them into gamekeepers look at sperver why if count ludwig were alive sperver's bones would long ago have been rattling in chains instead of which he is head huntsman at the castle all my theories were now in a state of disorganization i laid my head between my hands and thought a long while knapwurst supposing that i was asleep had turned to his folio again the gray dawn was now peeping in and the lamp turning pale indistinct voices were audible in the castle suddenly there was a noise of hurried steps outside i saw someone pass before the window the door opened abruptly and gideon appeared at the threshold end of chapter 10 recording by james k white chula vista chapter 11 of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by James K. White. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandra Chatrion. Chapter 11. Sperver's pale face and glowing eyes announced that events were on their way. Yet he was calm and did not seem surprised at my presence in Knapwurst's room. Fritz, he said briefly, I am come to fetch you. I rose without answering and followed him scarcely were we out of the hut when he took me by the arm and drew me on to the castle mademoiselle odile wants to see you he whispered what is she ill no she is much better but something or other that is strange is going on 
this morning about one o'clock thinking that the count was nearly breathing his last i went to wake the countess with my hand on the bell my heart failed me why should i break her heart i said to myself she will learn her misfortune only too soon and then to wake her up in the middle of the night weak and frail as she is after such shocks might kill her at a stroke i took a few minutes to consider and then i resolved i would take it all on myself i returned to the count's room i looked in not a soul was there impossible the man was in the last agonies of death i ran into the corridor like a madman no one was there into the long gallery no one then i lost my presence of mind and rushing again into the young countess's room i rang again this time she appeared crying out is my father dead no has he disappeared yes madam i had gone out for a minute when i came in again and dr fritz where is he in hugh lupus's tower in that tower she started she threw a dressing gown around her took her lamp and went out i stayed behind a quarter of an hour after she came back her feet covered with snow and so pale and so cold she set her lamp upon the chimney-piece and looking at me fixedly said was it you who put the doctor into that tower yes madam unhappy man you will never know the extent of the harm you have done i was about to answer but she interrupted me no more go and fasten every door and lie down i will sit up tomorrow morning you will find dr fritz at knapworth's and bring him to me make no noise and mind you have seen nothing and know nothing is that all sperver i asked he nodded gravely and about the count he is in again he is better we had got to the antechamber gideon knocked at the door gently then he opened it announcing dr fritz i took a pace forward and stood in the presence of odile sperver had retired closing the door a strange impression crossed my mind at the sight of the young countess standing pale and still leaning upon the back of an armchair her eyes of feverish brightness and robed in a long dress of rich black velvet but she stood calm and firm doctor she said motioning me to a chair pray sit down i have a very serious matter to speak to you about i obeyed in silence in her turn she sat down and seemed to be collecting her thoughts providence or an evil destiny i know not which has made you witness of a mystery in which lies involve the honor of my family so she knew it all i sat confounded and astonished madam believe me it was but by chance it is useless she interrupted i know it all and it is frightful then in a heart-rending appealing voice she cried my father is not a guilty man i shuddered and with hands outstretched cried madam i know it i know that the life of your father has been one of the noblest and loveliest odile had half risen from her seat as if to protest by anticipation against any supposition that might be injurious to her father hearing me myself taking up his defence she sank back again and covering her face with her hands the tears began to flow god bless you sir she exclaimed i should have died with the very thought that a breath of suspicion was harboured against him ah madam who could possibly attach any reality to the action of a somnambulist that is quite true sir i had had that thought myself but appearances pardon me yet i feared still i knew dr fritz was a man of honor pray madam be calm no she cried let me weep on it is such a relief for ten years i have suffered in secret oh how i suffered that secret so long shut up in my breast was killing me i should soon have died like my dear mother god has had pity upon me and has sent you 
and made you share it with me let me tell you all sir do let me she could speak no more sobs and tears broke her voice so it always is with proud and lofty natures after having conquered grief and imprisoned it buried and as it were crushed down in the secret depths of the mind they seem happy or at any rate indifferent to the eyes of the uninformed around and the eye of the most watchful observer might be mistaken but let a sudden shock break the seal an unexpected rending of a portion of the veil then as with the crash of a thunderstorm the tower in which the sufferer hid his sorrow falls in ruins to the ground the conquered foe rises more fierce than before his defeat and captivity he shakes with fury the prison doors the frame trembles with long shudderings sobs and sighs heave the breast the tears too long contained within bounds overflow their swollen banks bounding and rushing as if after the heavy rain of a thunderstorm such was odile at length she lifted her beautiful head she wiped her tear-stained cheeks and with her arm on the elbow of her chair her cheek resting on her hand and her eyes tenderly fixed on a picture on the wall she resumed in slow and melancholy tones when i go back into the past sir when i return to my first impressions my mother's is the picture before me she was a tall pale and silent woman she was still young at the period to which i am referring she was scarcely thirty and yet you would have thought her fifty her brow was silvered round with hair white as snow her thin hollow cheeks her sharp clear profile her lips ever closed together with an expression of pain gave to her features a strange character in which pride and pain seemed to contend for the mastery there was nothing left of the elasticity of youth in that aged woman of thirty nothing but her tall upright figure her brilliant eyes and her voice which was always as gentle and as sweet as a dream of childhood she often walked up and down for hours in this very room with her head hanging down and i an unthinking child ran happily along by her side never aware that my mother was sad never understanding the meaning of the deep melancholy revealed by those furrows that traversed her fair brow i knew nothing of the past to me the present was joy and happiness and oh the future the dark miserable future there was none my only future was tomorrow's play odile smiled bitterly and went on sometimes i would happen in my noisy play to disturb my mother in her silent walk then she would stop look down and seeing me at her feet would slowly bend kiss me with an absent smile and then again resume her interrupted walk and her sad gait since then sir whenever i have desired to search back in my memory for remembrances of my early days that tall pale woman has risen before me the image of melancholy there she is pointing to a picture on the wall there she is not such as illness made her as my father supposes but that fatal and terrible secret see i turned round and as my eye dwelt upon the portrait the lady pointed to i shuddered it was a long pale thin face cold and rigid as death and only luridly lighted up by two dark deep-set eyes fixed burning and of a terrible intensity there was a moment's silence how much that woman must have suffered i said to myself with a pain striking at my heart i know not how my mother made that terrible discovery added odile but she became aware of the mysterious attraction of the black pest and their meetings in hugh lupus's tower she knew it all all she never suspected my father ah no but she perished away by slow degrees under this consuming influence and i myself am dying i bowed my head into my hands and wept in silence one night she went on one night i was only ten and my mother with the remains of her superhuman energy for she was near her end that night came to me when i lay asleep 
it was in winter a stony cold hand caught me by the wrist i looked up before me stood a tall woman in one hand she held a flaming torch with the other she held me by the arm her robe was sprinkled with snow there was a convulsive movement in all her limbs and her eyes were fired with a gloomy light through the long locks of white hair which hung in disorder round her face it was my mother and she said odile my child get up and dress you must know it all then taking me to hugh lupus's tower she showed me the open subterranean passage your father will come out that way she said pointing to the tower he will come out with the she-wolf don't be frightened he won't see you and presently my father bearing his funeral burden came out with the old woman my mother took me in her arms and followed she showed me the dismal scene on the altenburg of which you know look my child she said you must for i am going to die soon you will have to keep that secret you alone are to sit up with your father she said impressively you alone the honor of your family depends upon you and so we returned a fortnight after my mother died leaving me her will to accomplish and her example to follow i have scrupulously obeyed her injunctions as a sacred command but oh at what a sacrifice you have seen it all i have been obliged to disobey my father and to rend his heart if i had married i should have brought a stranger into the house and betrayed the secret of our race i resisted no one in this castle knows of the somnambulism of my father and but for yesterday's crisis which broke down my strength completely and prevented me from sitting up with my father i should still have been its sole depositary god has decreed otherwise and has placed the honor and reputation of my family in your keeping i might demand of you sir a solemn promise never to reveal what you have seen tonight. i should have a right to do so madam i said rising i am ready no sir she replied with much dignity i will not put such an affront upon you oaths fail to bind base men and honor alone is a sufficient guarantee for the upright you will keep that secret sir i know you will keep it because it is your duty to do so but i expect more than this of you much more and this is why i consider myself obliged to tell you all she rose slowly from her seat dr fritz she resumed in a voice which made every nerve within me quiver with deep emotion my strength is unequal to my burden i bend beneath it i need a helper a friend will you be that friend madam i replied rising from my seat i gratefully accept your offer of friendship i cannot tell you how proud i am of your confidence but still allow me to unite with it one condition pray speak sir i mean that i will accept that title of friend with all the duties and obligations which it shall impose upon me what duties do you mean there is a mystery overhanging your family that mystery must be discovered and solved at any cost that black pest must be apprehended we must find out where she comes from what she is and what she wants oh but that is impossible she said with a movement of despair who can tell that madam perhaps divine providence may have had a design connected with me in sending sperver to fetch me here you are right sir god never acts without consummate wisdom do whatever you think right i give my approval in advance i raised to my lips the hand which she tremblingly placed in mine and went out full of admiration for this frail and feeble woman who was nevertheless so strong in the time of trial is anything grander than duty nobly accomplished end of chapter 11 recording by james k white chula vista chapter 12 of the man wolf this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. The Man Wolf by Emile Erkman and Alexandre Chatrion. Chapter 12. An hour after the conversation with Odile, Sperver and I were riding hard and leaving Nidic rapidly behind us. The huntsman, bending forward over his horse's neck, encouraged him with voice and action. He rode so fast that his tall Mecklenburger, her mane flying, tail outstretched and legs extended wide, seemed almost motionless, so swiftly did she cleave the air. As for my little Ardane pony, I think he was running right away with his rider. Leverle accompanied us, flying alongside of us like an arrow from the bow. A whirlwind seemed to sweep us in our headlong way. The towers of Nidic were far away, and Sperver was keeping ahead as usual when I shouted, Hello, comrade, pull up, halt. Before we go any farther, let us know what we are about. He faced round. Only just tell me, Fritz, is it right or is it left? No, that won't do. It is of the first importance that you should know the object of our journey. In short, we are going to catch the hag. A flush of pleasure brightened up the long, sallow face of the old poacher, and his eyes sparkled. Ha, ha, he cried. I knew we should come to that at last. And he slipped his rifle round from his shoulder into his hand. This significant action roused me. Wait, Sperver, we're not going to kill the black pest, but to take her alive. Alive? No doubt, and it will spare you a good deal of remorse, perhaps, if I declare to you that the life of this old woman is bound up with that of your master. The ball that hits her hits your lord. Sperver gazed at me in astonishment. Is this really true, Fritz? Positively true. There was a long silence. Our mounts, fox, and rappel tossed their heads at each other as if in the act of saluting one another, scraping up the snow with their hoofs in congratulation upon so pleasant an expedition. Leverle opened wide his red mouth, gaping with impatience, extending and bending his long, meager body like a snake, and Sperver sat motionless, his hand still upon his gun. Well, let us try and catch her alive. We will put on gloves if we have to touch her, but it is not so easy as you think, Fritz. And pointing out with extended hand the panorama of mountains which lay unrolled about us like a vast amphitheatre, he added, Look, there's the Altenberg, the Schneeberg, the Oxenhorn, the Rathal, the Berenkopf, and if we only got up a little higher we should see fifty more mountain tops, far away, right into the Palatinate. There are rocks and ravines, passes and valleys, torrents and waterfalls, forests and more mountains, here beaches, there firs, then oaks, and the old woman has got all that for her camping ground. She tramps everywhere, and lives in a hole wherever she pleases. She has a sure foot, a keen eye, and can scent you a couple of miles off. How are you going to catch her then? If it was an easy matter, where would be the merit? I should not then have chosen you to take part in it. That is all very fine, Fritz. If we only had one end of her trail. Who knows, but with courage and perseverance. As for her trail, don't trouble about that. That's my business. Yours? Yes, mine. What do you know about following up a trail? Why should I not? Oh, if you are so sure of it, and you know more about it than I do, of course, march on, and I'll follow. It was easy to see that the old hunter was vexed that I should presume to trespass upon his special province. Therefore, only laughing inwardly, I required no repetition of the request to lead on, and I turned sharply to the left, sure of coming across the old woman's trail, who, after having left the count at the postern gate, must have crossed the plain to reach the mountain. Sperver rode behind me now, whistling rather contemptuously, and I could hear him now and then grumbling. What is the use of looking for the track of the she-wolf in the plain? Of course she went along the forest side just as usual. But it seems she has altered her habits, and now walks about with her hands in her pockets like a respectable Freeborg tradesman out for a walk. 
i turned a deaf ear to his hints but in a moment i heard him utter an exclamation of surprise then fixing a keen eye upon me he said fritz you know more than you choose to tell how so gideon the track that i should have been a week finding you have got it at once come that's not all right where do you see it then oh don't pretend to be looking at your feet and pointing out to me at some distance a scarcely perceptible white streak in the snow there she is immediately he galloped up to it i followed in a couple of minutes we had dismounted and were examining the track of the black pest i should like to know cried sperver how that track came here don't let that trouble you i replied you are right fritz don't mind what i say sometimes i do speak rather at random what we want now is to know where that track will lead us to and now the huntsman knelt on the ground i was all ears he was closely examining it is a fresh track he pronounced last night's it is a strange thing fritz during the count's last attack that old witch was hanging about the castle then examining with greater care she passed here between three and four o'clock this morning how can you tell that it is quite a fresh track there is sleet all round it last night about twelve i came out to shut the doors there was sleet falling then there is none upon the footsteps therefore she has passed since that is true enough sperver but it may have been made much later for instance at eight or nine no look there is frost upon it the fog that freezes on the snow only comes at daybreak the creature passed here after the sleet and before the fog that is about three or four this morning i was astonished at sperver's exactitude he rose from his knee clapping his hands together to get rid of the snow and looking at me thoughtfully as if speaking to himself said it is twelve is it not fritz a quarter to twelve very well then the old woman has got seven hours start of us we must follow upon her trail step by step on horseback we can do it in half the time and if she is still going about seven or eight tonight we have got her fritz now then we're off and we started afresh upon the track it led us straight to the mountains galloping away sperver said if good luck only would have it that she had rested an hour or two in a hole in a rock we might be up with her before the daylight is gone let us hope so gideon oh don't think of it the old she-wolf is always moving she never tires she tramps along all the hollows in the black forest we must not flatter ourselves with vain hopes if perhaps she has stopped on her journey so much the better for us and if she still keeps going we won't let that discourage us come on at a gallop it is a very strange feeling to be hunting down a fellow creature for after all that unhappy woman was of our own kind and nature endowed like ourselves with an immortal soul to be saved she felt and thought and reflected like ourselves it is true that a strange perversion of human nature had brought her near to the nature of the wolf and that some great mystery overshadowed her being no doubt a wandering life had obliterated the moral sense in her and even almost effaced the human character but still nothing in the world can give one man a right to exercise over another the dominion of the man over the brute and yet a burning ardor hurried us on in pursuit my blood was at fever heat i was determined to stand at no obstacle in laying hold of this extraordinary being a wolf hunt or a boar hunt would not have excited me near so much the snow was flying in our rear sometimes splinters of ice bitten off by the horseshoes like shavings of iron from machinery whizzed past our ears sperver sometimes with his nose in the air and his red moustache floating in the wind sometimes with his grey eyes intently following the track reminded me of those famous cossacks that i had seen pass through germany when i was a boy and his tall lanky horse muscular and full-maned its body as slender as a greyhound's completed the illusion 
Liverle, in a high state of enthusiasm and excitement, took bounds sometimes as high as our horses' backs, and I could not but tremble at the thought that when we came up at last with the pest, he might tear her in pieces before we could prevent him. But the old woman gave us all the trouble she could. On every hill she doubled, at every hillock there was a false track. After all, it is easy here, cried Sperver, to what it will be in the wood. We shall have to keep our eyes open there. Do you see the accursed beast? Here she has confused the track. There she has been amusing herself sweeping the trail, and then from that height, which is exposed to the wind, she has slipped down to the stream and has crept along through the cresses to get to the underwood. But for those two footsteps she would have sold us completely. We had just reached the edge of a pine forest. In woods of this description the snow never reaches the ground except in the open spaces between the trees, the dense foliage intercepting it in its fall. This was a difficult part of our enterprise. Sperver dismounted to see our way better, and placed me on his left so as not to be hindered by my shadow. Here were large spaces covered with dead leaves and the needles and cones of the fir trees, which retain no footprint. It was, therefore, only in the open patches where the snow had fallen on the ground that Sperver found the track again. It took us an hour to get through this thicket. The old poacher bit his moustache with excitement and vexation, and his long nose visibly bent into a hook. When I was only opening my mouth to speak, he would impatiently say, Don't speak. It bothers me. At last, we descended a valley to the left, and Gideon, pointing to the track of the she-wolf outside the edge of the brushwood, triumphantly remarked, There is no feint in this sortie, for once. We may follow this track confidently. Why so? Because the pest has a habit, every time she doubles, of going three paces to the right. Then she retraces her steps, four, five, or six in the other direction, and jumps away into a clear place. But when she thinks she has sufficiently disguised her trail, she breaks out without troubling herself to make any feints. There now, what did I say? Now she is burrowing beneath the brushwood like a wild boar, and it won't be so difficult to follow her up. Well, let us put the track between us and smoke a pipe. We halted, and the honest fellow, whose countenance was beginning to brighten up, looking up at me with enthusiasm, cried, Fritz, if we have luck, this will be one of the finest days in my life. If we catch the old hag, I will strap her across my horse behind me like a bundle of old rags. There is only one thing troubles me. And what is that? That I forgot my bugle. I should have liked to have sounded the return on getting near the castle. <laughs> he lighted his stump of a pipe, and we galloped off again. The track of the she-wolf now passed on to the heights of the forest by so steep an ascent that several times we had to dismount and lead our horses by the bridle. There she is, turning to the right, said Sperver. In this direction the mountains are craggy. Perhaps one of us will have to lead both horses while the other climbs to look after the trail. But don't you think the light is going? The landscape now was assuming an aspect of grandeur and magnificence. Vast gray rocks, sparkling with long icicles, raised here and there their sharp peaks like breakers amidst a snowy sea. There is nothing more sadly impressive than the aspect of winter in a mountainous region. The jagged crests of the precipices, the deep, dark ravines, the woods, sparkling with boar-frost, like diamonds, all form a picture of desertion, desolation, and unspeakable melancholy. The silence is so profound that you hear a dead leaf rustling on the snow, or the needle of the fir dropping to the ground. Such a silence is oppressive as the tomb. It urges on the mind the idea of man's nothingness in the vastness of creation. How frail a being is man! Two winters together without a summer between would sweep him off the earth. At times we felt it a necessity to be saying something if only to show that we were keeping up our spirits. Ah, we are getting on. How fearfully cold. Liverle, what is the matter? What have you found now? Unfortunately, Fox and Rappel were beginning to tire. 
they sank deeper in the snow and no longer neighed joyfully and added to this the endless mazes of the black forest wearied us too the old woman affected this solitary region greatly here she had trotted round a deserted charcoal burner's hut farther on she had torn out the roots that projected from a moss-grown rock there she had sat at the foot of a tree and that very recently not more than two hours since for the track was quite fresh and our hope and our ardor rose together but the daylight was slowly fading away very strangely ever since our departure from nidic we had met neither woodcutters nor charcoal burners nor timber carriers at this season the silence and solitude of the black forest is as deep as that of the north american steppes at five o'clock it was almost dark sperver halted and said fritz my lad we have started a couple of hours too late the she-wolf has had too long a start in ten minutes it will be as dark as a dungeon the best way would be to reach roche cruz which is twenty minutes ride from here light a good fire and eat our provisions and empty our flasks when the moon is up we will follow the trail again and unless the old hag is the foul fiend himself ten to one we shall find her dead and stiff with cold against the foot of a tree for nothing can live after such a tremendous tramp in weather like this sibalt is the best walker in the black forest and he would not have stood it come fritz what is your opinion i am not so mad as to think differently besides i am perishing with hunger well let us start again he took the lead and passed into a close and narrow glen between two precipitous faces of rock the fir trees met over our heads under our feet ran a mere thread of the stream and from time to time some ray from above was dimly reflected in the depths below and glinted with a dull leaden light the darkness was now such that i thought it prudent to drop my bridle on rappel's neck the steps of our horses on the slippery gravel awoke strange discordant sounds like the screaming of monkeys at play the echoes from rock to rock caught up and repeated every sound and in the distance a tiny space of deep blue widened as we advanced it was the issue from the glen fritz said sperver we are in the bed of the tunkelbach this is the wildest spot in the black forest the end is a pit called la marmite du grand goulard the muckle-mouthed giant's kettle in the spring when the snow is melting the tunkelbach hurls all its waters into it a depth of two hundred feet there is an awful uproar the waters dash down and then splash up again and fall in spray on all the hills around sometimes it even fills the roche crews but just now it must be as dry as a powder flask whilst i was listening to gideon's explanations i was at the same time meditating upon this dark and fearful glen and i reflected that the instinct which attracts the brutes into such retreats as these far from the light of heaven away from everything bright and cheerful must partake of the nature of remorse those animals which love the open sunshine the goat aloft upon a high conspicuous peak the horse flying across the wide plain the dog capering round his master the bird bathed in sunlight all breathe joy and happiness they bask and sing and rejoice in dancing and delight the kid nibbling the tender grass under the shade of the great trees is as poetic an object as the shelter that it loves the fierce boar is as rough as the tangled brakes through which he loves to run his huge bristly back the eagle is as proud and lofty as the sky-piercing crags on which he perches as his home the lion is as majestic as the arching vaults of the caves where he makes his den but the wolf the fox and the ferret seek the darkness that conforms to their ugly deeds fear and remorse dog their steps i was still dreamily pursuing these thoughts and i was beginning to feel the keen air moving upon my face for we were approaching the outlet of the gorge when all at once a red light struck the rock a hundred feet above us purpling the dark green of the fir trees and lighting up the wreaths of snow ha cried sperver we've got her at last 
my heart leaped we stood closely pressed the one against the other the dog growled low and deep cannot she escape i asked in a whisper no she is caught like a rat in a trap there is no way out of la marmite du grand goulard but this and everywhere all round the rocks are two hundred feet high now vile hag i hold you he alighted in the ice-cold stream handing me his bridle i caught in the silence the click of the lock of his gun and that slight noise threw me into a tremor of apprehension sperber what are you about don't be alarmed it is only to frighten her very well then but no blood remember what i told you the ball which strikes the pest slays the count don't trouble yourself was the answer he went away without further parley i could hear the splash of his feet in the water then i saw his tall figure emerge at the opening of the dark glen black against a purple background he stood five minutes motionless attentive bending forward i looked and listened still moving onward as he returned i was but a few yards from him hark he whispered mysteriously look there at the end of the hollow scooped out perpendicularly like a quarry in the mountainside i saw a bright fire unrolling its golden spires beneath the vault of a cave and before the fire sat a man with his hands clasped about his knees whom i recognized by his dress as the baron de zimmerbluderich he sat motionless his forehead resting between his hands behind him lay a dark gaunt form extended on the ground farther on his horse half lost in the shade reared his neck gazed on us with eyes fixed ears erect and nostrils distended i stood rooted to the ground how did the baron de zimmer happen to be in that lonely wilderness at such a time what did he want here had he lost his way the most contradictory conjectures were passing in confusion through my excited brain and i could not tell what conclusion to arrive at when the baron's horse began to neigh and the master raised his head well donner what is the matter now said he then he too directed his gaze our way straining his eyes through the darkness that pale face with its strongly marked features thin lips and thick black eyebrows meeting together and forming a deep hollow on the brow in the form of a long vertical wrinkle would have struck me with admiration at any other time while now an inexplicable anxiety laid hold of me and i was filled with vague apprehensions suddenly the young man exclaimed who goes there i monseigneur answered sperver coming forward sperver chief huntsman to the lord of nideck a flash shot from the baron's quick eye not a muscle of his countenance quailed he rose to his feet gathering his pelisse over his shoulders i drew towards me the horses and the dog and this animal suddenly began howling fearfully is not every one more or less subject to superstitious fears at these dismal sounds i trembled and a cold shudder crept through my whole body sperver and the baron stood at a distance of fifty yards from each other the first immovable in the midst of the deep glen his gun unslung from his shoulder the other erect upon the level platform outside of the cave carrying his head high fixing on us a haughty eye and a proud look of superiority what do you want here he asked aggressively we are looking for a woman replied the old poacher a woman who comes every year prowling about nidic and our orders are to take her has she stolen anything no has she committed murder no monseigneur then what do you want with her what right have you to pursue her and you what right have you over her answered sperver with an ironical smile see there she is i can see her at the bottom of the cave what right have you to meddle with our affairs don't you know that we are here in the domains of nidic and that we administer justice and execute our own decrees the young man changed color and said coldly i have no account to render to you 
beware replied sperver i am come with proposals of peace and conciliation i am here on behalf of the lord yeri hans i am in the execution of my duty and you are putting yourself in the wrong your duty cried the young man bitterly if you talk about your duty you will oblige me to do mine well do it cried the huntsman whose features were becoming disturbed with anger no replied the baron i am not responsible to you and you shall not come here that's what we shall soon see said sperver drawing nearer to the cave the young man drew his hunting knife perceiving this menacing action i was about to dart between them but happily the hound which i was holding by his collar slipped from me with a violent shock and threw me on the ground i thought the baron would be lost but at that instant a wild shriek rose from the dark bottom of the cavern and as i rose to my feet i saw the old woman standing erect before the fire her tattered garments hanging loosely about her her gray and tangled locks floating wildly in the wind she flung her bony arms in the air and uttered prolonged piercing howls like the cry of agony of the hungry wolf in the long cold nights of winter when famine is gnawing his entrails never in my life have i seen a more fearful apparition sperver motionless his eyes riveted on the fearful object before him and his mouth open with astonishment stood as if rooted to the earth but the powerful dog surprised himself at this unexpected sight stood still for a moment then with a bend of his bristling back in preparation for a mighty leap he made a rush with a deep impatient growl which made me tremble the platform before the cave was about eight or nine feet from the level where we stood or he would have reached it at a single bound i can yet hear him clearing a way through the snowy brambles the baron flinging himself before the woman with a piercing cry my mother then the dog taking another spring and sperver quick as lightning raising his gun and bringing down the poor animal dead at the young man's feet this was but the work of a second the gulf had been illuminated with a momentary flash and the wild echoes were vibrating with the explosion from rock to rock till it died in the far distance then silence again settled on the gloomy scene as darkness after the lightning when the smoke of the explosion had cleared away i saw liverle lying outstretched at the foot of the rock and the woman fainting in the arms of the young man sperver pale with concentrated rage and excitement and eyeing the young baron darkly dropped the butt of his gun to the ground his features discomposed and his eyes half hid in his gloomy frown senor de bluderich he cried with his hand extended i have killed my best friend to save the life of that unhappy woman your mother thank god that her life is bound up with that of the count of nidic take her away take her hence and never let her return here again if you do i cannot answer for what old sperver may be driven to do then with a glance at the poor dog oh liverle liverle he cried was it to end thus come fritz let us go i cannot stay here i might do something that i should have to repent of and laying hold of fox by the mane he was going to throw himself into the saddle but suddenly his feelings of distress overcame all restraint and bowing his head upon his horse's neck he burst into sobs and tears and wept like a child end of chapter twelve recording by james k white Chula Vista.